Yes, yes, yes. This is, you are listening. If you just tuned in, you're checking out uh, Black West Chester Presents, the People Before Politics radio show. This is episode 330. Um, the first uh, hour we were dealing with the uh, nomination of the new um, uh, um, Supreme Court justice, and we had two uh, local legal experts come on and, 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 and have that conversation with us. The second half of the show, we will be dealing with ending um, well, qualified immunity, what it is, um, and, and we'll be hearing from a few people that are working to end it. Um, before they do that, let me play this quick uh, word uh, uh, ID check real quick, uh, and we will have them when we come back. You are now tuned into the People Before Politics radio show, brought to you by the good folks at Black West Chester. Black West Chester. Black West Chester. Black West Chester. Check the newspaper. Black West Chester. Black West Chester. Black West Chester. Check the newspaper. Real talk for the community since 2014. And we are back, and we have our guests. Hello, Darlene, Katrina, and Corey, who is definitely a friend of the show. Welcome to the People Before Politics radio show. Hey, what's going on? Hi, everyone. Hello. What's up, everybody? So first and foremost, I know like with everything, um, a lot of people I talk to still to this point does not know what qualified immunity is. Can we start there and just educate everybody? What is qualified immunity and why is it important that we need to end that? I wish we had kept the lawyers on from the previous segment because none of us are lawyers, but- Oh, I, I was even thinking that was, <laughs> I, I was gonna get out here. That we we talk about it a lot. So we try to make it so that people who don't speak lawyer can, can understand what this thing is, but- Basically, um, it was it is a defense that the Supreme Court invented, the judicial principle of law that the pre Supreme Court said um, government officials can use uh, when they're being sued for a rights violation. So if my rights get violated and I want to hold that uh, government employee accountable, I can sue them in federal court. But in federal court, they can bring up the defense of qualified immunity, which says unless I can find a case that's exactly identical, where a government official was found guilty of the same thing under the same set of circumstances, that government official can't be held liable. So what it is in practice is an insurmountable barrier because victims of rights violations have to find an identical case. And then, and I'm sure we'll talk more about this, what's even worse is that it becomes a pass for government officials to violate our rights because the courts can say, I know that this thing that just happened was either illegal or uh, or really wrong and a violation of your rights, but simply because you can't find this exact case from the same jurisdiction, you're not going to get any justice. And then often the courts are not even answering, did a rights violation happen in the first place? So we're getting stuck in this pattern of not being able to hold, hold uh, government officials accountable for when they vi violate our rights. So as long as they find a new way to do it, they straight then, basically. That's, what you're saying. that's the most perverse part of it, right? Like the more diabolically creative you are in the way that you violate someone's rights, the less likely that exact thing has happened before and the more likely you are to get away with it. Like the George Floyd thing, we had never really seen somebody with their knee on someone's neck like that before. It wasn't like the chokehold. It wasn't like all the other situations. So identically it qualified, I'm glad qualified immunity did not protect those officers, but because we never saw that before, and that's probably never been prosecuted, they could have, someone could have argued with them to get off because of that, right? Yeah, so this is, just to clarify, this is in civil cases, so this is in lawsuits. The city settled, mm -hmm. you know, when it came to Derek Chauvin, but there was a world in which Derek Chauvin could have been found criminally guilty and still been granted qualified immunity in the civil courts. It's just that they settled oh, civil. Okay. even even got to, to address any of that. I mean, I, I guess so. I mean, um, 
I always found it interesting, whether you believe that OJ did it or not, that he was found criminally innocent, but then civilly guilty. I always, I always found that very interesting, you know. Yeah. Darlene. Yes. Hi, AJ. Hello. Hello. Welcome to the show. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Great to be here. So secondly, I wanted to get out there. Don't y'all have some kind of walk or some kind of event coming up on the 18th? What is that yeah. about? What, when, where, how, why? Yeah. yeah um, the 18th, we're working with some okay. um, folks in Westchester to um, actually do like phone banking and things like that. So a few people in Westchester are interested in phone banking, calling their, um, you know, legislative officials um, to get them on the bill. So that's on the 18th. Um, but very exciting thing that we have coming up in Westchester is on April 9th, we plan to have a big event in Westchester. So, you know, Nancy Maldonado, who I know is listening, you know, her son, Jonathan, um, died at the hands of police in Greenberg. Greenberg Police Department, yes. Correct. And, you know, we want to honor her son, you know, um, also Kenneth Chamberlain. You know, we're hoping that he's able to make it at that time as well. Um, and all the, you know, all the families, um, you know, that have lost loved ones to violence. Okay. I think, and um, I think um, Sandy Barnaby and someone else got together. I think we're doing, we're doing a full show on qualified immunity and that event like the, Cause that's like a Monday or Tuesday, or something like that. Sunday before, whatever that Sunday before is, that first Sunday in April, we will be doing a whole show on that and bringing everyone together. I, I, I want to um, going back to what qualified immunity is. Now, Corey, you have a a, a a vantage point that most you served as law enforcement. Um, so talk about qualified immunity on that end, and 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 the good, the bad. You know why it's bad. You talking to me? Or why it's not bad? Whatever your opinion is. <laughs> You talking to me? Yes, Corey. Yes, yes, you. My I lost you guys. I lost yes, you. Yes, yes, yes. I just caught the end when you said qualified immunity. What's good and bad about it? So, what so, so I want you to so, so, yeah, as a coming from a law enforcement perspective, because you've been you served in law enforcement, so you may look at it through a different lens. So, I wanted to hear from you. From a law enforcement perspective, especially a cop, you know. Cops don't want to do anything. You lose me they, again? Still they just want car blanche. Cops want car blanche. They don't want to be, they don't want no oversight whatsoever. But one of the biggest factors for having getting rid of qualified immunity is because now, like families will get their chance in court. They'll get their chance in court. And when you look at like qualified immunity, I think um Darlene probably have statistics less than like out of 100 cases, only like two, maybe two cases, they bring up 2% qualified immunity. So cops are still being indemnified no matter what. They're still being indemnified because, you know, the biggest protection is um the Fourth Amendment, Darlene, right? The Fourth Amendment is the biggest protector. Anyway, so cops are still being protected. When you look at the cases, you'll see that the municipalities are still paying out they're still paying out and they're still protecting cops even cops just like wrongly convicted they're still indemnifying them so it's really not it's not a bad thing so cops need to get off this high horse that like get rid of qualified immunity you're going to lose your house you're going to use your car and your white picket fence that's not even going to happen if they don't have qualified immunity but what's going to happen is now families that have their day in court where their their story can actually be heard, and that's just in layman's terms, simple terms. I gotta say, and I, I don't know if it's a popular thing. If a if a if an officer is violating the law and 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 and, and um, violating the policies and procedures that he was in his training, um, the taxpayers shouldn't have to pay for it. You know, he should miss. He should. He sh it should. He should be have to pay a portion of that. I think I think that would that would alter the future. That would be an attitude adjustment in in some of them situations, them future situations. If you've seen that happen to other officers, it'd definitely be an attitude adjustment. Everybody knows at the end of the month when you got to pay that that mortgage. You know, 
it, it, it changes the game. You know, you got to pay the tuition for kids. It changes the game. You know, if those things are on the line. But then, you know, there's the other piece to the qualified immunity. Like, for me, like, as a police commander, right? Everybody got sued. I got sued. My name was on it. I wasn't even there. I, you know, most of the times I'm home to sleep. So that's the that's the argument on the law enforcement piece, too, that I hear from law enforcement. Because, like, commanders, you know, like, Joe Smith went out and did something. It's going to be the police commissioner, the commanding officer, you know, everybody is on the line for this one case that this person did. So should those other people that wasn't there be on the hook? And that's what the problems these unions these unions are, are bringing up, right, Darlene? Yeah. So, you know, a lot of times people bring up um, if we end qualified immunity, you know, individual officers will lose their home. If we end qualified immunity, no one will want to be a police officer. You know, those are the arguments that you hear on the other side. Um, however, you know, currently as it stands, you know, it may not be codified in law, but officers are generally, it's like 98.9% of the time indemnified. So generally the taxpayers are paying, you know, the settlements. Um, that's how it currently stands. That's just how it is. Um, you know, we don't have any agency in, in the, what is it called? The um, agreement as far as, you know, the, the agreement with the unions and everything like that, whether it be police, whether it be corrections, that's all bargaining that they do. And the public doesn't have any agency in that. So, you know, currently as it stands, officers are indemnified. So they're not paying these, these settlements themselves. Um, and unfortunately with qualified immunity, many of these cases don't get to get heard by a jury. So that's what this is really about, right? The case is being heard on the merits by a jury. If we prevent them simply because of qualified immunity, and they never get actually heard by a jury. They only get seen by a judge who then applies this doctrine that was made up. And I'll let Katerina go into that uh, about where qualified immunity came from. Um, hopefully, you know, the people listening got to see Black Westchester this month where we put that ad in on page three. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as you open it up, right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, you know, and it's very interesting how qualified immunity evolved, right? Um, but, you know, as it stands, if, if we don't do anything about qualified immunity, some of the cases never get to get heard in the first place. And, you know, and I want to say one more, I want to say one more thing real quick about the, the, the resident, the taxpayers paying. Okay. So, so I've never heard this argument before, but in my mind, this is how I see. So if my loved one, my child, my spouse, whoever was killed by the police and we sued them. My taxpayer, my tax dollars is going to go to paying me for what they did. I mean, am hey. I, I'm just, yeah. I've never heard nobody make this argument before. And that makes no sense to me. Yeah. I'm, I'm just, I'm just. I mean, you know. it's essentially it's yours, mine and everyone else's, right? right? right. Um, but you shouldn't be paying for it. You shouldn't be paying towards the reward that you're getting from losing this loved one. I mean, initially you're putting into that as well. I mean, yeah. that's that's how I see it. Maybe, maybe that's not true, but that's that's how it appears to me on, on the outside. Today. Yeah, and, and you're not the only one. It appears like that to many people. It appears like that to me even, you know. Um, maybe I'll just get into what brings me to this to this fight. So, you know, yes. I, and I know you've heard this um, before, uh, AJ. So my son in 2017 was 22 years old and he was in a correctional facility in Buffalo, New York. And he, you know, he was in keep lock for, for three months because they said he smoked. So, you know, one day I got a phone call from someone that was incarcerated with him one morning and he told me that my son was beaten by about 15 officers the day before. And he said, my son was severely beaten. He was hogtied and thrown down the stairs. And he was, you know, just telling me, call the facility, call the facility. And when I did, you know, after getting the runaround, you know, I was told, I, I said, is my son in the hospital? And they were like, no, he's back very nonchalantly. So 
I then had to wait hours and finally received a phone call from a reverend saying, sit down. And after just my whole world went black, I, um, you know, had to wait two months, uh, two, two weeks, I'm sorry, two weeks to get my son's body. My son did not look like himself. When I saw him in the casket, um, four months I had to wait to get the autopsy report. Mm. The autopsy report said that he had blunt force trauma all over his entire body. Um, I did not try to look at pictures of my son, but I did have to get them through foil and accidentally came across one of the pictures, which was horrendous. I quickly just shut it out, but his head was completely deformed. His face was deformed. He could barely see. He couldn't eat solid food. And that, you know, I can see from the nurse's notes. Um, so, you know, things like this could happen. And then you hear the words qualified immunity. So that's how I first knew what qualified immunity was. You know, I filed a federal lawsuit after several years of getting FOIL requests um, in because you don't know anything when your loved one dies, right? The police, the corrections, they're very secretive. They won't tell you anything. Um, so I had to try to get whatever information. And by that time, you know, the, the law had changed where 50A was supposed to, you know, give us some transparency on some of the records. So I was able to get some things luckily, but that took many years. And I also could not find an attorney. Uh, many attorneys turned me down because I really didn't have any information. What was I gonna tell them? My son's dead and, and he was beaten. But the, it's the officer's word against people that are incarcerated. So um, after much time, I got the attorneys, we filed the federal lawsuit and suddenly I learned what qualified immunity was. They're telling me these officers could get off because of qualified immunity, because they're doing their job and maybe something unfortunate happens. So that's the problem here. In my particular case, there's been an OSI, a, a Office of Special Investigation, um, did an investigation. They determined that my son was in fact assaulted by officers and they, they falsified documents. So even with all that, there's an administration process that happens then but in the administration process, they let the officers go without any punishment at all. And then you have the civil process. And in the civil process, qualified immunity could prevent your case from even being heard on the merits. We haven't even gone through discovery yet. And the officers have already claimed qualified immunity. Wow. Dr. Bob, you got any comments, questions? Yeah. A. Hey. Yours is, is a heartbreaking story, Darlene, and to hear you recount it for us um, live on air um, is, is very moving, very poignant. We, we can imagine your pain, um, especially for those of us who have children. Um, I think the real impact of qualified immunity is to be measured in the loss that so many loved ones have suffered without at the very least having their day in court and having an impartial tribunal determine um, if the officers, um, if suspicions that the officers um, acted illegally was in fact true, or whether this was, you know, legitimate in some uh, strange way. But, but, but you know, what we don't talk about or, or another dimension of this in terms of public policy is, is the cost to the particular communities who are forced to foot the bill for the um, actions of officers who, um, you know, act under the color of law. And the fact that the real difficulties that people continue to have in getting justice in court in many respects only continues to encourage this kind of behavior. And the price is to be measured in the hundreds of millions of dollars. I mean, as we were just talking, 
<laughs> I did a quick internet search. This is hardly systematic research, but uh, a quick look at reliable sources indicates, for example, in, Flo um, in Chicago in recent years, the um, city has paid out nearly half a billion dollars. And that's in one um, major city. Um, these are often cities in which you have uh, a police force with a sizable number of white officers policing um, a community with sizable numbers of people of color. These communities themselves are often distressed and um, already struggling under you know, the weight of financial obligations and to see their money continuously drained off, it only adds further insult to injury and really does um, make a victim not only of the immediate loved ones, um, but I think as you all were alluding to, to the community as a whole in ways that it just does not seem to serve anyone and really cries out for uh, some sort of reform. So I think one of the things that is so amazing about the bill that we're fighting to, to get passed is that it's not um, only about making sure that victims and survivors of that violence have their fair shot at justice or their day in court, but to prevent that violence from happening in the first place. You know, Darlene and I talked to so many families. We don't want there to be more Nancy Maldonados and more Kenneth Chamberlain Juniors, and the list is can go on and on and on. And we can look at what happens when a state ends Colorado when a state ends qualified immunity. We know we have a year and a half of evidence from Colorado. They ended qualified immunity for police officers uh, in mid 2020. That the number of cases, first of all, didn't go up because the the instances of misconduct went down. That's what we want. We want the misconduct to go down so that. No family has to experience this horror so that communities don't have to continue to shell out the money, right? And I think one of the most amazing examples of how this is all going to work and play out is New York City and limited qualified immunity for NYPD officers in a very limited way. So we're not going to say that they ended qualified immunity by any means. But right after they did that, the SBA, the PBA, um, all the unions sent out a letter to all of their members, and it literally says, do not engage in any interactions with the public unless you are, quote, clearly and unequivocally sure your actions are within the bounds of the law. That's what we thought police officers are supposed to be doing all the time, right? And then, but what we know is because they have this shield of accountability, um, they are, as Justice Sotomayor, you all were just talking about the Supreme Court justice nominee, uh, nominees, right? Justice Sotomayor says qualified immunity allows officers to shoot first, think later. But what we saw from the union's response when New York City ch started to change the qualified immunity uh, uh, shield was that officers now have to think before they act. And one of the things specifically about like New York City, right, ending or thinking they ended or limiting qualified immunity was that it doesn't include corrections, which is a huge problem, you know, not just in New York City, but across the state, right? Because we have Rikers Island and we've seen a humanitarian crisis at Rikers Island within these past years. And then especially, you know, the news was that there were 16 people that died last year alone. We've already had one person die this year. Um, and people are talking about it, but what's being done about it? And these families are suffering, right? I, I mean, I've talked to um, Tamara Carter, who is the mother of Brandon Rodriguez, and he died. He was one of the people that died at Rikers Island, right? And she has no answers. And I can tell you from experience that when you are a family member of a person, especially that dies at the hands of, of either corrections officers, police officers, what you are totally alone. You have no information whatsoever. It is nearly impossible to get information out of these people. And you don't even know where to start. You know, 
it also takes a lot of resources. It takes a lot of money. I spent $20,000 to send private investigators to the facility where my son was to get statements from the people that were incarcerated with him so that I could get those witness statements immediately, right? Um, that's how I started. You know, from that, I know that some of these officers should have records, and that's a big problem too. The reason that they don't have records is because sometimes they do investigations and they make them unsubstantiated. And when they make them unsubstantiated, they don't make it into their disciplinary record. And when they don't make them into the disciplinary record, then nobody knows about them. You foil their disciplinary record and it's like it doesn't exist. So this particular sergeant, I foiled his record. It looks like he's a Boy Scout until he did what he did to my son. But I know that's not true because the private investigators were able to show me other cases where he was implicated, where settlements were paid out, you know, by the state, right, for his bad conduct. But the public doesn't know about these things because they're able to hide them. And it needs to stop. AJ, I just wanted to add something because the crux of the issue with qualified immunity is a lack of transparency and information sharing, the, which is antithetical to principles of basic democracy. <laughs> you have a democratic order when people have available to them information about the performance of the public officials who they have either elected or who have in turn been um, appointed by elected officials. We will not be able to get a handle on this matter um, and resolve it in a democratic fashion if uh, the state is making so many efforts to effectively shield the public from gaining awareness of the record. I say this partly because, um, Darlene, AJ and I actually took a look in recent months um, at the availability of the personnel file and disciplinary records of members of the entire New York, uh, entire Westchester County um, police force, every police force in Westchester County, thanks to Low HUD, um, who uh, did foiled the information and then uh, published it on a database on their website. And without fail, probably the amount of information that was available was, um, just a small, tiny little fraction. Probably, I think we have 24 municipalities, something like that, um, major municipalities in New in Westchester County, and maybe one or two of them had records available. Mount Vernon, they don't have anything. Yonkers, they don't have anything. They're waiting for the results of the case. The case, my understanding is that this court case that was pending in New York State, that would, at which the personnel records of police officers was at stake had been uh, decided in the favor of greater transparency. And yet, you know, months later, we still seeing that you can't figure out what the hell the police officers are doing. Um, and it, it really is shameful and an affront to our democracy. And it's one of the reasons why people are growing increasingly cynical. Because the state, uh, if we want to talk about the deep state, which is a term that love that conservatives love to bandy about. If there ever were an example of a deep state here in the United States, it's the legal wall that has been constructed to prevent the public from seeing what our frontline law enforcement officers are. The ones who interact with the public on a regular basis using widely recognized tools of law enforcement. We can't figure out what they're doing not to speak of, um, you know, supervisors and others who also may have some degree of culpability um, as they sit at their desk. 
from the various decisions that they've made. You know, I want to add that if a supervisor routinely overlooks reports of misconduct on the part of an officer that is under his or her control, that person bears some responsibility for any future misconduct that they commit. And we hear this all the time. The reason that the Mount Vernon Police Department is currently under federal investigation is because there are credible um, claims that the supervisory officers in the department turned a blind eye to a lot of misdeeds that they were aware of and now has come back to bite us. Um, and it really is unfortunate because, you know what, we need good policing. You know, I'm critical. I am critical of the police, absolutely, when they, you know, overstep their boundaries. And you want me to tell you what? I'll be honest, as a civilian, I'm, I'm sure I, I need to work at, you know, trying to be as respectful as possible of police officers. But having said all of that, the onus for reform of U.S. police force is not, lies not with the change in attitude of civilians. <laughs> so this issue of transparency is interesting and it comes up all the time. Transparency, I could not agree with you more, is fundamental to a democracy in every single way. We know that that there's a lot of funny business happening right now with with these uh, transparency lawsuits and and the you know the the requirement uh, for these disciplinary records to be made transparent. Um, and I think qualified immunity, as Darlene already said, would also help to bring so much transparency because we would have to bring these things up in court. You can't just throw a case out. Those those facts of the case will have to be presented. But transparency just it can't end there, right? You can't have transparency for transparency's sake because you need the accountability mechanism after that. Um, and otherwise, what are you going to do with the information that you learn if you have no way to hold someone accountable for, for what you find out or for a pattern of behavior that, that gets uncovered? And could not agree with you more that, you know, this is not in any way an anti-police thing. And there are a lot of law enforcement um, of officers and officials, just like Corey, who do support this because they see this as being the mechanism to make those supervisors start to change their behavior. So we have Brendan Cox, the former chief of police, uh, retired chief of police of Albany, right? And he says, I know that if we end qualified immunity, the 500 plus chiefs of police of all the different police departments across New York State are going to have to think really, really, really carefully about how are they training people? How are they disciplining people? How are they hiring people? These are all those things that, you know, that get to the questions you said, you, you like police, you want police to make you feel safe, but we need to have the right people in those positions and definitely not allow the ones who have a demonstrated track record of violating the rights of people to continue to be able to be uh, in that job. So that's why it is so, so, so crucial that we end qualified immunity because that is the number one uh, barrier to justice, barrier to accountability, shield from accountability. And it's allowed a culture because it's not just about the legal process and the steps that happen in a legal case, but it's about a culture. There is a culture of impunity because there is impunity, right? I think one example that we always give Darlene and I when we're talking to people is we need the accountability mechanism because without it, we can keep passing all these laws to regulate behavior. Chokeholds were banned in New York City before Eric Gardner was murdered in a chokehold. But those officers correctly calculated they would face no consequences for murdering him in a chokehold. Uh, so what incentive did they have, you know, to, to, to act otherwise in accordance with the rules? And I know this isn't every officer, right? This, but this is some of them. Um, and we need to make sure that it's clear that there are consequences. If you and I, I'll just give you an example. If any of us walked into someone's home and stole $225,000 of cash and rare coins, surely we would be held liable for that. But police officers in California, while executing a search warrant, went into someone's home, stole cash, $225,000 worth of cash and rare coins, um, while executing a search warrant. And simply because no police officer had ever done that before while executing a search warrant, 
they got off and they didn't have to pay the money back. So it's creating these two legal systems that uh, I don't think is right. And you want to talk about the deep state, you know, some of the most conservative people also agree with ending qualified immunity because they see that this is, you know, this is a matter of, do we want to protect our constitutional rights? Why do we have two legal systems, one for us and one for government officials? And it's not just police, it's it's all government officials that are able to use this. So I don't want to, you know, I don't mean to keep signaling out uh, police officers. Um, yeah, Katarina, let me tell you, you think these chiefs of police have problems dealing with training and hiring people. Probably 90% of the police chiefs shouldn't even be there you gotta understand like this is a real deep state policing is real deep and they're codified and I, i'm telling you they go along and get along and they take care of each other in the police world again you know i was retired you know nine years i did 21 years i love good police but i hate bad police and bad policies and qualified immunity is a bad thing and we need to get rid of it and i'm gonna tell you this I don't even think it's going to be a change in behavior if it's gone. These road cops, they are who they are. I don't even think it would, it wouldn't even be a problem, especially in the Department of Correction, because correction is enclosed, indoors, you know, policing at least is outside. Maybe a little, a little bit of people might change a little bit, but lepers don't change stripes. These cops, the ones that's out of control, they'll still do the same thing. I promise you that. Well, I hope we get to see that. I mean, I, one thing I want to know is, you know, the, there are so many police officers that I've spoken to that say when they speak to other police officers, um, they support ending qualified immunity in private. But why aren't they talking about it in public? You know, and I think it speaks to some of what you're saying, Corey, because yeah, that, they don't want to sure, that blue wall of silence is massive. Yeah. Exactly. It's that it's the so-called blue wall, but uh, most of the cops, it's really not this blue wall that people think. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, cops are constantly snitching on one another in the back rooms. I promise you that. Just from my experience, they're all snitching on each other, but no one wants to speak out because no one wants to be the sore thumb. That's the problem. No one wants to step out. You only have like, you know, the Eric Adams, Corey Pegues, Edwin Raymonds of, you know, NYPD, Noel Lita, Tony Moran. You know, I could name people, like 10 people that spoke out in the last 25 years. No one wants to speak out. No. And you, face, you all face great consequences for doing it, right? Yeah. Edwin Raymond faced horrible consequences. Exactly. We, we faced a tremendous amount of consequences. But we all know that, you know, we stand on the back of the 3Ms, Malcolm Martin and Mega. So... You know, it's not a problem. We dealt with it and we're still here and still speaking out. But you ladies know I support y'all. Uh, I'm about to get out of here. My babies are crying. Oh. <laughs> I got to get them ready for school tomorrow. I love you guys. All right. Nice to see you. Yes, Corey. Cool. We're looking forward to seeing you real soon, man, in a couple Thank of weeks you. when you're going to um, join yeah. us remotely for a screening of your uh, biopic, Cops and Robbers. We'll announce more details uh, later on. So thank you. Okay. Good night, everyone. Right. Good night. I wanted to just say something about this, like who pays or uh, problem, because you know what we just heard, and I heard I've heard it on the show before. Damon has said things like there's a problem among the management, among superiors, right? So I think the people who who are who wrote the bill to end qualified immunity have thought through very carefully about. If you just make individual officers pay, how are you going to change the wider system, right? And so if this is a, a systemic problem, then you also have to have systemic solutions, solutions that are going to, to go beyond just one or two actors. So. You're on mute, AJ. Katarina, I mean, Darlene told us I'm still on mute. No, no, we can hear you. Hear me now? Yeah. Oh, Darlene told us why. Okay, Darlene told us what made her, how she found out about qualified immunity, what got her into this fight. Katarina, what what brought you into this? What made you want to tackle this? 
my um, job job, as one of the previous guests called it, is uh, I direct peace building projects in Iraq and Libya and Colombia. So I work with local organizations who are trying to make their communities more peaceful, prevent violence from happening, address violence from, you know, the violence that does happen in their communities. So, and I, uh, I'm a professor of peace and conflict studies. So to me, you know, after the George Floyd protests started uh, erupting and I was kind of, you know, seeing who was responding with what, who was actually interested in addressing some of the root causes of police violence. Um, and so we, you know, a bunch of us came together. We're a grassroots led organization. We're all volunteers. Darlene and I both have other day jobs, but spend a whole full time job worth of time trying to get this bill passed. Um, but that, you know, that's what brings me to this because I think that this is fundamental in terms of values of de democracy. It's, we have a constitution. Should we or should we not have the ability to protect our constitutional rights, right? And how do we prevent violence? How do we address the root causes of the violence? Just like we want to address the root causes of uh, increase in gun violence and things like that that we're seeing in our communities or, uh, you know, across the country, you have to think about what is actually at the root. And if, if a culture of impunity is one of the things that is at the root of violence at the hands of corrections officers, police officers, even if it's just one person, two people, three people whose families have been affected, that's way too many. Um, and we got to figure this out. So that's why I'm really passionate about this fight that we're in. You know, you know, you know, one of the other core problems is when you have an officer who has been identified and has had complaints against him in a department, the police department, I know people are not gonna like this. The police department move like the Catholic church. They just move him to another department in another community. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, I know my Vernon has brought some people in that were bad in the community they was in. They shouldn't be able to get another job, but they they, they just move on to another community. And, and I'm like, okay. And then they do the same thing there. And then they don't get fired. They don't go to jail. They, they, and they, they allow to either retire and keep their pension or they move to another department. And I heard, you know, even worse, um, I was on a call where the police chief of Mount Vernon was kind of talking about some of the efforts for reform that he's trying to put through. And one of the things was that, you know, Mount Vernon's budget, and I'm not, I'm not advocating for increased budgets for police agencies, but he was saying the budgets are so small, so they can't attract good officers, <laughs> you know? So with low salary- well, that, Not only that, Mount Vernon, Mount Vernon is yeah, Mount Vernon is the least paid, the lowest paid police department in Westchester County. Um, I know an officer who may have been making somewhere around 90 in Mount Vernon. She left and went to Greenberg making 130, 140. You, you know what I'm saying? We're not talking about detectives and lieutenants and sergeants. We're talking about an officer. You, you understand what I'm saying? So, and, and, and it's also said about Mount Vernon, an officer of Mount Vernon with two years is worth an office anywhere else with 10 years of experience because of all the crime, the, the, the calls they have to take and all the crime they have to deal with. So other departments welcome them in and then they pay them more. So so that is that, you know, and 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 and, and yeah, the salaries is, is, is an issue. Darlene, there was a comment from Nancy that I feel like Definitely. you could speak to because we talk about this a lot. What was it? it? Right. I, can't, I can't see it at the moment. Oh. Oh, the best form of payment would be if they were um, charged criminally and lost their job. And yeah, I mean, we talk about that a lot. And one of the things is, unfortunately, you know, we as civilians don't have any agency in whether or not criminal charges are brought, right? That's up to the DA or the attorney general. And we can yell and scream, but that's not going to make them bring criminal charges, right? So then there's the administration process. And the administration process, as I said, honestly, I imagine it's the same in policing as it is in corrections. It's a complete joke. I mean, it would take me too long to tell you what happened in my son's case. I finally got the transcript, but it's a complete joke. Um, and then the only thing we have agency, unfortunately, is to bring a civil lawsuit. And then we bring a civil lawsuit and some judge could turn around and say, um, you know, well, 
even if I don't like this rule, because it's essentially a rule, it's a doctrine. Um, and we, and we talked about like where it came from and everything like that. But even if I don't like this rule, I have to apply it. I mean, there have been judges that have applied this doctrine to a case and then dissented from themselves. So basically wrote a dissent about how much they did not like making the judgment that they did because they don't agree with it. But, you know, it's up to the, they, they felt it was up to the Supreme Court to, to be the ones to deal with qualified immunity since the Supreme Court made it up in the first place. And, you know, I mentioned, we, we just quickly mentioned where it came from. So, also, I wanted to, uh -huh. um... Okay, go ahead, go ahead. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. No, go ahead, go ahead. Okay, yeah, so. Uh, no, 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 I was, I, I was gonna. No, that's okay. Go ahead. I guess we got have a delay, so you go. Right. One of the things that, um, I didn't mean to interrupt you, one of the things that, um, that I've learned from a few um, stories that I've done and I could be wrong. I might not have all the information. You know, I see a lot of these cases that have happened over the last few years. The officer was allowed to sit there and negotiate and work on his, put his papers in and retire and put his retirement in. And as long as he is able to retire, his pension is safe, even if there is a civil lawsuit against him later, that day you can't touch his pension. Um, and uh, speaking to what Nancy was saying, the officers should be, you know, because we say, oh, well, at least they're not on the department no more. But no, now they get to live off of their pension. You, you know what I'm saying? You know, they should be fired. If they're fired, they lose their pension. I think a lot of people don't know the differences there. You know, because I've heard a lot of people say, well, you know, we got him off the department. He's not a cop no more. That's good. But he, he's the damage is done and he has a pension now, you know, so. There are so many problems that we have to fix. So, you know, today we're focused on qualified immunity. So I think a lot of those problems come up in the union contract process. And that's something we all have to keep our eyes on because so many of these problems come from what the contract says. I, I don't know specifically. I bet you the pensions issue comes straight from the union contracts, right? So, um, yeah. So, 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 so many problems. I think right now for us, it's really important that we get this because it is one of those foundational issues. It's like all these other things and all these other rules that we change. Don't pepper spray a minor, of course, but when you pepper spray a minor, like how are we gonna hold you accountable? Um, and then also, I mean, you you all know this better than than we do, right? You've been by Kenneth uh, you know, Kenneth Jr.'s side for 10 years, right? Because of qualified immunity, this case has been dragged on for 10 years. It's been bounced back and forth, right, through the courts. And when we were at the vigil with you all uh, that marked the 10-year anniversary of Kenneth uh, Chamberlain Sr.'s death, he said, I haven't even been able to begin mourning the loss of my father. And I think that's what right. we hear from a lot of families is that these cases get dragged out. Qualified immunity is a thing that is intentionally used to drag out cases. Um, a lot of times family members don't even make it through this. Darling can, you know, share more heartbreaking examples of that. Yeah. Um, so let these cases get to a, a you know, a, a court, like Nancy said in the comments, right? Let them be heard on their merits. Let them be decided on the facts. Don't just throw them out because of this strange law that the Supreme Court invented as a backlash to the Freedom Riders who were fighting, you know, for civil rights uh, and then had their rights violated and had the audacity to sue the police officers for violating their rights, you know? So we got to figure this out because it's such a foundational piece. And then, um, you know, then let's start another, a new organization, <laughs> AJ, and deal with all these other issues because there's so many of them that we got to, we have to fix, obviously, to make this Makes yeah, I, I it's often a, say it's like a huge mountain and we have to chip, chip away at it. Like many people would like to knock down the whole mountain, right? But it's not possible to knock down a mountain all at once. We need to chip away at it. And as Katarina said, this is a foundational piece. This is something that for one is rooted in racism. It goes all the way back to the civil rights movement, right? It 
its foundation is in racism and it's still a rule that we're using today, you know, with a conservative Supreme Court, you know, right now. So it really makes no sense for us to keep this in play. It's been hurting people for a long time. And as Katerina said too, she alluded to, I know so many families that um, have had suits against, you know, officers, police officers, corrections officers, what have you. Um, many people here, I'm sure, have heard the story of Khalif Browder. Um, his mother died before that case ever got settled. I mean, according to his brother, the case was never actually really settled, even though it was um, reported in the news as such, but it was not actually settled. Um, then you have, you know, a case that happened after a year after my son, same prison. His mother died before that case ever, you know, even got filed, you know, let alone anything else. So, you know, for families to, for one, lose their loved one, or even victims, they don't even have to, you know, involve somebody that died, but someone that was brutalized, someone that was, we just uh, saw a hearing the other day of the legislator um, that was about rape in prisons, right? So people that are violated in that way, you know, this affects people all over. This can affect people, you know, in their own homes, in interactions with police. It affects children in school, in interactions with resource officers. It, 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 it really hits a lot of different places. So we painted a really depressing picture, but the good thing is that there is something that we can do about it. I saw you just put that in the chat, right? There is a bill that we are fighting for that to will end qualified immunity. Um, we really have a chance of getting it passed before session ends June 2nd, but that's just a few months. So we need everybody, everybody, everybody to help. Westchester is such an important place uh, because of, you know, who your senators are in Westchester, right? Um, so if you follow us uh, on Twitter or Instagram, and QINY, um, if you go on Instagram and you go to our link tree, you can get, uh, get the link, uh, registration link for the Westchester Virtual Day of Action that you just put up there, which we're so excited to be working with the Anti-Racist Alliance and the Alternatives to Incarceration Coalition and Westpac and all of the amazing organizations in Westchester who understand why it's so important that we end qualified immunity. So this is gonna be an amazing few hours. You'll You'll learn about what qualified immunity is, get any questions answered. There's going to be a rally. You'll hear speakers. And then there's a chance to actually take action, which, you know, as crazy as the world is right now, I think it does feel really good when you feel like you can do something because it's super easy to feel helpless. There's a lot happening right now. But if you believe that victims deserve a chance at justice, if you believe that we should be able to protect our constitutional rights, we didn't even get into this, but um, you know, a lot of law enforcement think that this is critical to addressing public safety, right? So if you want New York to be safer and you want police to be able to do their jobs safely uh, and effectively, then we have to end qualified immunity. Um, Kenneth Chamberlain just chimed in. I fully support and qualified immunity. May there be accountability for Kenneth Chamberlain Sr. May there be accountability for the families impacted by police violence. Absolutely. Um, also, I wanted to, now that I got the dates. So on Sunday, April 3rd, um, we will be doing an entire show on ending qualified immunity. And I'm, I'm told there will be some families, some other families that will be on to speak out. And then Saturday, April 9th, from 11.30 to 2, 11.30 a.m. to 2.30 p.m. will be a family day of justice at the Fountain on Maine and Mamaronic and White Plains. And I'm seeing in capital letters, there will be free Ben and Jerry's ice cream. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, so, we have, so uh, I just wanted to, yeah. I wanted to share that. So, yeah, so we will be dealing with this. Like we wanted to have you on now because of the event that Bob put the flyer up um, um, uh, Friday, March 18th, a day of action um, of speakers then in real time calling our legislators to pass um, New York's to pass legislation and um, um, of uh, S1 
991 in the Senate and A4331 in the Assembly. So uh, that's what we wanted to have you all come on immediately, but we will have an entire panel um, back on Sunday, April 3rd. I, I think this is very important. I think we need to tackle these conversations. Um, of course, like I say in every other conversation, an hour is not enough to even get to the heart of why everything that is wrong with this thing and why it needs to be done. But hopefully it will be the beginning of a conversation. Those who are watching now, who will watch later on the replay or on the archive on Black Westchester, hopefully if you if you if you're you learn something, share this with someone else you think needs to see this. Um, we have to start these conversations. We have to get this information out. And then y'all that are watching, y'all have to go into your circles and continue these conversations. Like, you know what I'm saying? And, 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 and you know, that's, that's why we do what we do. I want to thank both of you for coming on. Um, um, I want to thank you for your time. Um, it was great officially meeting y'all in person at the 10th anniversary uh, of mm -hmm. Kenneth Chamberlain and yeah. White Plains. I think I've, I met y'all for the first time in person. Yeah, that that was good. Um, I appreciate the work y'all are doing. I mean, you know, I appreciate Katarina that you're involved in this, and Darlene. It's a shame that many times this has to this hits our front door, and that's why we're doing the work. Be, <clears throat> we're doing the work because it has hit our front door. And I say, and I say to everybody watching, <clears throat> join these fights. Don't uh, don't wait till it hits your front door. Cause it can hit your front door next. Don't wait for it to hit your front door. You know, so many, some of the people that you've seen on our show, that's why they got into it <clears throat> because it did hit their front door. But you know, you don't have to wait for it to hit your front door to join the movement, to support, to spread the word. And it costs you nothing to spread the word. You know what I mean? And 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 it's very important. And that's why you know I hope, like I said, we started the conversation tonight and. You know, I hope, you know, we planted the seeds and they will grow where they need to grow. Um, Dr. Bob, any last words? I'll it. just echo what you said, AJ, by encouraging our viewers to um, participate in some of the actions. I'm so thankful for um, people like Darlene and Katerina, amongst many others, who are part of the coalition, who are out there in the leadership, to try to do the organizing and the real fruit of their labor is us. It's when we participate. Th these programs are not undertaken so that the organizers themselves show up. They're going to be there, but rather they're relying on the strength of numbers. And so I urge everyone to add their body, add their voice uh, to this campaign. I look forward to seeing um, you guys out there along with other people like Patty, who I know, um, Kenneth Chamberlain Jr., who I know are um, part of this effort um, to see what we can do to um, turn, you know, to address a, 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 you know, grave act of misjustice. I'll just say Westchester is amazing. We're organizing across the state, Darlene and I, but the passion in Westchester is very inspiring for us. So thank you to all the organizers um, that you're, you know, you're talking about. We're really, really lucky to work with them. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. And I'll echo the same thing, you know, very important. Darlene, yeah. What? I was going to say, Darlene and Katerina, any last words? Uh, Again, no. how people can get in touch with y'all. Any other events I didn't mention? Anything else people can do to get involved? Any of that. Just throw all that out. All right. That's Katerina. Okay. <laughs> this campaign, it's Darlene is the boss and she tells me what to do and I do it. So um, if you feel swayed to take action right now in less than two minutes, text the words go, G-O space E-N-D-Q-I-N-Y, -E uh, go space N-Q-I-N-Y to the number 504. 409. That'll send a letter to your representatives right away, urging them to uh, to sponsor the bill. Easiest way is to go to our website, endqiny.org. The Take Action page has a bunch of ways for you to take action. Follow us on Twitter, endqiny. We'll always be putting our latest actions there. Join us in Westchester uh, virtually on the 18th. Join us in person on the 9th. 
We're going to Albany on May 4th. We need everybody in Albany for a Mother's Day action the Wednesday before Mother's Day. Tons of ways to take action. We make it easy. We give you the tools. Darlene and I didn't know anything when we started this. We're figuring it out as we go. So don't feel shy. Join us. Um, you know, I think it's it's we just have to do this. We have to get this bill passed. Can you give that number again, the text number? The number to text, please give that number again. 50409. And text what? What did they go? E N D Q I N Y. Go space N Q I N Y. But go to our website, nqiny.org, take action page, and you can press a button and it'll open up a text and send the text immediately. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, I thank you, ladies, um, for the work that you do. Thank you. Um, I thank you for coming on here and sharing. Um, Black Westchester um, is an ally and um, has been since I heard about this. Um, and, and we will continue to do everything we can do to get the word out. Um, and um, I just want to say thank you for coming in here. And I will see you all on the 9th uh bob that did actually did you have last words anything you wanted to say or any oh and shout out to nancy uh kata maldonado she's i didn't uh, shout, shout out to her um we we've been big supporters of her and standing in her fight for justice and we will continue as we have been with kenneth chamberlain senior we will continue to keep the name alive and keep it out there so they can't just, this is never going to be swept under the rug. This is never going to be, it's never going to be over. We're going to continue to make noise. We're going to continue, uh, you know, not just on the anniversaries, you know, we're going to continue to just keep putting it out there. And, you know, um, we're encouraged by how much you fight. I mean, you know, we're encouraged by that. And the least we could do is be there for you and stand with you. And that's that's what we do. So, you know, we we, we, we try to stand and keep the name alive. And, um, you know, we will continue to do that. Um, without further ado, I guess if there's no more comments or anything. Um, oh, yes. Um, Katarina, if you are, are you in Westchester often? I could, Darlene and I said we were going to come up to Westchester and get a fat stack and leave them in some strategic places. So I, I, have a, I, have a, I have a stack of 50 for you. If you need more, oh, you can come soon then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you just just hit me. Um, Darlene knows how to reach me. Um, just mm -hmm. hit me. Let me know. And, you know, um, I will give you my address and you can come get them. And please, and we need, that's what we want. Get the stuff out there, especially different places where it hasn't gone before. So um, we think that's important. So, yes, just you come get them. I'll give them to you. Sounds like a road trip. There you go. There you <laughs> go. Up on the way. <laughs> there you go. Um, shout out to Patty Dukes. Um, yes, Nancy, we will continue to stand with you. Um, thank you, Patty Dukes, and thank you, Darlene and Katarina. Um, thank you for Corey for standing, coming in. Um, uh, good, strong support of the show, Bob. Um, yeah, announce when the thing is uh, in my running uh, uh, library with Corey. Oh, okay. Thank you. So that's going um, on Saturday, March 19th at 1 p.m. We'll be continuing our monthly Decipher series. And this um, for this month, we're going to be screening um, the biopic that's recently put out about the life of uh, Corey Pagese, who was just on the show a few minutes ago. Um, it Following the screening, which is about an hour and a half, we'll have a panel discussion that AJ is going to moderate. And it will also feature Damon Jones, uh, the publisher of Black Westchester, who is not here today. And Corey will be participating from remote location. So that's Saturday, March 19th at 1 p.m. at the library. Um, we'll be distributing um, marketing and promotional material that will um, give you more information about how to obtain tickets. It is, it is a free event, but there are it is a ticketed event. Um, and you can also find information be posted at the library's website as well. And if you can't find it anywhere, of course, come to Black Westchester, email me, blackwestchester at gmail.com. Um, lastly, yes, the, the, uh, if you haven't seen the issue, um, 
Um, I can send you the link to the digital copy that's out now. Um, and, 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 and if you need physical copies, contact me. And we're working on the March um, uh, Women's History Month. You know, we, we, we do things a little differently here. So it was Black History Month last year. Um, I felt there was nothing to gain by telling y'all that, um, you know, Harriet Tubman freed some slaves again and, 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 and Martin Luther King had a dream. So, so, so I wanted to do something for that can benefit black people now. And we created, uh, kind of a black business, black owned business directory. And it lists like two to 300 of black owned businesses in Westchester County. There was so much more, but that's all I could get the information on. And, you know, and hopefully it will continue. It will to, for us to recycle our dollars in our community. Um, for for March and is is traditionally Women's History Month, so I'm doing a Women's History uh, edition, and um, we're not just going to talk about the women who did stuff in the past and they're not here no more. We're gonna like we did last year. We're giving flowers to a lot of the women in Westchester um, while they're alive, because you know usually you see these write ups on these women. When they when they're when they're dead, you know, or they did all these great things, and there's all these things written about them, you know, and we like to bring out, like we did last year, some unsung heroes you don't know anything about, and and we're working on that now. Last chance that the advertising that is Friday, um, I believe the, the the date is the 11th, but with this coming Friday is the last day to advertise. The paper will come out somewhere around. Uh, the next Friday, the 18th. So if you're interested in advertising in this special issue, email us at blackwestchester at gmail.com and we'll send you the rates. Um, uh, with that said, that's it. Y'all could be doing anything else right now, but y'all decided to ride with us and we greatly appreciate it. This has been Black Westchester Presents, the People Before Politics radio show. We are on every Sunday, 6 to 8, streaming live on Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube. Um, until next week, um, peace. Bye. 22 million black victims of Americanism are waking up and they're gaining a new political consciousness, becoming politically mature. And as they become, uh, develop this political maturity, they're able to see the recent trends in these uh, political elections. That any minority that has a block of votes that stick together is in a strategic position. And either way you go, that's who gets it. You're, you're in a position to determine who go to the White House and who stay in the doghouse. You're the one who has that power. You, you and I have never seen democracy. All we've seen is hypocrisy. <laughs> Not through the eyes of someone who has who has enjoyed the fruits of Americanism. We see America through the eyes of someone who has been the victim of Americanism. We don't see any American dream. We've experienced only the American nightmare. We haven't benefited from America's democracy. We've only suffered from America's hypocrisy. And the generation that's coming up now can see it and are not afraid to say it. 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 And are not afraid to say it.